Welcome to my CCNA Security Lecture Review. Here we're looking at Chapter 6, Securing the Local Area Network. Our objectives are, sorry, the outline is Endpoint and Layer 2 Security. So let's jump right into our Endpoint Security. We're going to be looking at describing Endpoint Security and enabling those technologies, explaining how the Cisco AMP is used, and explain how Cisco NAC authenticates and enforces specific security policies. I always like NAC, and we don't sadly get to talk about it too often, but NAC, features like Cisco's NAC or Microsoft's NAP are really important. All right, so again, endpoint security. Endpoint security is what we think. It is endpoint security. It is not so much security at the perimeter, but it's going to be more internal to that. So securing LAN elements, that does include things like an ACS. That does include things like the IPSs, IDSs, and our perimeter firewall. Because, I mean, traffic may have to leave our network, so we do have a perimeter firewall as part of our LAN element. Traditional endpoint security deals with cross-sections between antivirus, anti-malware, host-based IPSs, IDSs, and host-based firewalls. All of these combined have host-based protection. Keep in mind, a lot of these also have a network-based portion. There is network antivirus, there is a network IPS, IDS, and there are network firewalls. So we're taking a different look at our design when we're talking about this because we can have both network-based and host-based for layered protection or for def defense in depth. The borderless network is a growing concern because how do we protect our devices, our network, our data as our networks no longer have the traditional boundaries that we would normally associate with a corporate network. So securing endpoints in that borderless network post malware, so we can be assuming if we get malware, what should we be asking? Where did it come from? What was the threat method and point of entry? Who was affected? Systems that were affected? Accounts that were affected? Uh, what did the threat actually do? How can we make sure we can prevent this from happening again? How do we recover from it? When we're dealing, uh, dealing with host-based protection, again, we could be including things like data loss prevention um, mechanisms, blacklisting, filtering based off of spam or URLs, and again, making sure we have things like antivirus, anti-malware, and so forth. Modern security solutions will have things like AMP, NAC, ESA, as, uh, again, layered defense. Hardware and software encryption on local data is also becoming more critical because as our devices become mobile, we still have to have access to, to the data that we have to work from. But how do we make sure that data is being protected? All right, so let's go ahead and let's talk about anti-malware protection. Normally, advanced malware protection you want, again, layers. Before malware occurs, discover, enforce, and harden our systems. During uh, malware uh, infection or running, hopefully we're looking at detecting, blocking, and defending the malware. And uh, posts would be the scope, contain malware, and hopefully uh, remediate. Part of the APM and managed threat events throughout the Cisco security platform, Taylor's team's uh, 
gather real-time threat intelligence from a variety of sources. Normally, we're looking at multiple million of deployed security devices and millions of endpoints. They analyze the data, normally daily, and they're able to come up with better managed threat defense because of the heuristics that they're able to use to analyze this mass amount of security data. We have AMP for endpoints, for networks, and for content security. Content security is the integrated features in the Cisco cloud that includes things like web security or Cisco web and email security appliances. AMP for networking, that's going to be things like the Cisco ASA firewalls or firepower. Uh, for endpoints, again, that's going to be integrates with the Cisco AMP for networks to deliver the comprehensive protection across the extended network and all endpoints, including uh, ones that are global. Getting into email and our web security, pretty straightforward is we need to start worrying about how we can protect both of these uh, assets. The nice thing is Cisco does have protections for both. Part of their email security solution, they have the global threat intelligence, uh, of course anti-spam, advanced malware protection, and they also have uh, the ability to control outbound message with outbound message controls. That way, if your account's been compromised, maybe they can use the outbound message control to make sure you're not sending it outside. Uh, there's additional things for this outbound message, but that's more in-depth than what this class is for. Typically, we have our WSA. Basically, when you go to send something or to access a website, you can actually have everything funnel through the web security appliance or the WSA. That way, it checks everything out before sending to the internet or sending back to the client. Let's talk about this controlling network access. If we're looking at NAC, you actually have the ability to control what's happening on the network. You can control the network ad uh, admissions control. What I mean by that is when you connect, should you be allowed on the network? Yes or no? And part of NAC's functions is typically when you go to connect, it will provide some type of authentication to verify that you are you, but also, uh, do you meet the correct security profile? Network access devices could be switches, could be access points, could be routers or firewalls, and so forth. And again, normally there's some type of AAA and NAC server verifying that you are meeting the criteria before you get access to network resources or to the network itself. NAC components are things like the NAC guest server, the NAC manager, the profile server, and typically some type of directory service to authenticate against. The manager manages, the profiler actually pushes out the profiles that you're supposed to be configuring to. One of the nice things is you have things like network access for guests. Through a to grant sponsor or sponsor permissions to only those accounts created by the sponsor, to all accounts, or to no accounts. Basically you can't change any of the permissions. The Cisco NAC profiler again should be sitting out there and it should be in direct communication with the appliance manager and the NAC collector application. Basically as it comes online they should be reviewing the profiler profiles to verify that they can actually gain access. Right, moving on let's talk about layer 2 security. We're going to talk about layer 2 vulnerabilities 
overflow attacks for the cam table, port security, VLAN trunking and mitigation for specifically VLAN hopping, DHCP snooping, dynamic ARP inspection, DAI, and implementing IP source guard. What's really funny is these are some basic layer 2 security technologies and so many organizations don't bother to implement them for whatever reason. Alright, so let's talk about Layer 2's threats. Again, here we're dealing at the uh, Layer 2. The frames, typically Ethernet, it's going to be the initial compromise. That will allow for uh, higher level, higher layer to be compromised. So again, when we're dealing with layer two, we're think, uh, thinking things like ARP, DHCP, VLAN attacks, CAM attacks, STP, and so forth. And I'm looking at this, it's just very surprising when you think about how easy it is to mitigate a lot of these types of attacks, yet how many organizations truly don't. So let's go ahead and let's dive right in. CAM table attacks. If you're on a Cisco switch and you're looking at the CAM table, you can show MAC address table, you can see the appropriate MAC addresses, the ports, and how they were learned, and what VLAN they're on. Uh, CAM table operation example as as the switch learns, switch is powered on, things start uh, broadcasting or unicasting or communicating, Layer 2 addresses are learned. A CAM table attack, the intruder would run the attack tool and it will fill the CAM table with bogus information typically. Uh, not always bogus, but it could be just garbage data until the table is full. The switch will flood all, all traffic and then the attacker starts capturing that traffic. Here's an example. So how do we mitigate it? How do we make sure that our CAM table attacks aren't working? Countermeasures for CAM attack actually would be uh, basically you can set how they're updating. You can set uh, pruning as well. Port security is a very big one. You can actually enable or disable port security and what you want to have happen when violations occur. So you enable it, you verify port security is turned on and how many MAC addresses you want and then you set the appropriate options. Normally aging is a big one uh, MAC address maximums, how many do you want it to learn up to, and what to do of a violation. Typically, violation is disable, but maybe you don't want that. Maybe you want, or sorry, violation is shut down, not disable. So I'll turn off the port. Maybe you don't want that. Maybe you want a different option. Setting the maximum number, normally switch port, switch port, port security maximum, and you say how many you want. You can have a MAC address, and you can set a sticky MAC address if necessary. Sticky MAC addresses will allow you to learn it dynamically. That way you can set, you know, learn one address sticky, and then the first MAC address it learns, that's the one that it remembers. Typically, they come in three violation modes. Protect, restrict, or shutdown. Shutdown is default. Again, forwarding traffic, none of them. Send messages to the syslog. Restrict and shutdown will. Increase violation counter. Again, restrict and shutdown will. Shutdown the port will only happen if the shutdown is the violation mode. Typically, restrict is a little bit better one. That way, if uh, you plug in a device that's not approved, 
the port doesn't get turned off. That way, later down the line, if you plug in something that is approved, the port is not shut down. So it will actually start allowing you to pass traffic. Port security aging. Switch port, port security aging. And then you set the time as appropriate. Time. Type absolute. Type in a, uh, interactive. There are the descriptions. Normally you can specify the age. You can set the absolute age time. And you can set the inactive aging type as well. You can also do port security with phones. Here you're looking at enabling port security. It will learn three MAC addresses. Violation mode is shut down and the aging time is set to 120 seconds. You can also do SNMP MAC address filtering or notifications. And the SNMP traps are sent to the appropriate uh, network management station with the addresses or when old ones age or time out, age out. Moving on, we have VLAN hopping attacks. And that is where you can actually have one device set up a trunk onto a switch and you can now jump between multiple VLANs. So a common question is how do they do this? Normally they would manipulate the frame so that it has VLANs for both. So when it goes over the trunk, the trunk will strip off the native VLAN, in this example VLAN 10, and will send it to the other switch. At that point the switch will go, oh, this has a VLAN and I will assign it to that VLAN. So again, it's about being able to double tag the frame so it belongs to both VLANs. Mitigating. Basically, you can actually set it so that the uh, native VLAN, for in this example 10, it will not process secondary VLANs as it comes over. We also have PVLAN edge features that allow us to have protected and unprotected ports. We also have what's called private VLANs, but that is for a CCMP uh, level type course. You can verify protection by doing a show interface, looking at the switch port details, and you can actually see if the protection is enabled or not. To a degree, we have private VLANs, but not going into too much detail. We have promiscuous and community ports. You can actually set it so you can have isolated ports that will only communicate with the uh, network device and they will not allow communication between one another. Moving on, DHCP or mitigating DHCP you can have a DHCP spoofing attack and that is where you can actually have a the traditional DHCP discover offer request and acknowledgement section you can also have what's called a starvation attack and that is where the attacker initiates a starvation basically a DHCP discover uh, X or X being the size of the scope and essentially you force the DHCP server to run out of addresses and then again you do the requests and then the server should respond with all of the uh, acknowledgments and again end result DHCP server no longer has any addresses to issue mitigating the appropriate VLAN attacks it could be uh, simple things like unauthorized DHCP servers. You can set that uh, so that if they're coming on untrusted ports, they're not there. You can also set unauthorized DHCP client messages not adhering to snooping binding tables. That way, again, it's no longer valid. 
You can also set DHCP relay agent packets that include option 82nd or 82 on untrusted ports. Again, basically setting it so that those ports cannot be a DHCP server. It would only be listening on trusted ports. And anything facing access layer switches or an access layer device would be an untrusted port. That way DHCP snooping would only allow DHCP to be issued from trusted ports. So how do we enable it? You can actually just go to a global configuration, type in IP DHCP snooping. That's it. Once you do that, you need to start uh, trusting or not tr trusting interfaces. So you navigate to the appropriate interface that you want to trust, and you do an IP DHCP snooping trust. That would trust the interface. The other ones, you can actually do a snooping limit rate, and that just limits the rate of snooping. And you can also, glo uh, through the global configuration, set which VLANs to snoop for. You can uh, verify by doing an I or show IP DHCP snooping, and that will show you which ones are binding and uh, addresses and leases and so forth. So how do we mitigate ARP attacks? ARP spoofing and ARP poison attacks is typically where the layer 2 device starts filling up the ARP cache and the attacker can actually poison or spoof their MAC address and forward it to the switch for it to learn. Well, we have what's called Dynamic ARP Inspection, DAI, and with that, it again, it inspects dynamically, or it inspects all ARP requests. And the nice thing with that is it uses resources, but it really is simple to inspect it, and it really helps mitigate the spoofing uh, attacks, especially when you're dealing with like man in the middle. And how do we configure that? Basically, we can have trusted ports that we don't need to worry about, and we can have untrusted ports, and those are going to be things connected to the hosts or the access switches. And from there, it will actually inspect all untrusted port traffic. Anything coming on those ports that it doesn't trust, it will inspect. Again, you enable it by IP DHCP snooping. You can set the appropriate VLANs. If you're dealing with ARP inspection, you can issue that with a IP ARP inspection and the appropriate VLAN. And then again, how we set our trust ports. If we're doing a DHCP trust, It'd be IP DHCP snooping trust. If we're doing ARP inspection, it would be uh, IP ARP inspection trust, again, on the trusted ports. How do we set up DHCP snooping? Uh, again, it's going to be done through the global configuration. It'd be IP ARP inspection, and you can actually uh, validate IP or source destination MAC addresses and then you can actually do more with that. Destination MAC again it validates the destination. The source MAC will validate the source. IP will validate the entire IP regardless source or destination. Moving on, mitigating the address spoofing types of attacks which we've already talked about, the switch port being able to be spoofed, having MAC addresses changed. For each untrusted port, there are two possible levels of IP traffic security. We can uh, filter off of source IP, or we can filter off of source IP and MAC address. And that's part of the IPS gene. Uh, spoofing guard. So we are, sorry, IP source guard, not spoofing guard, but source guard. You can actually verify sources. 
so that anything coming in would have to be verified. Moving on, let's talk about spanning tree protocol. Spanning tree, again, if we have a switching loop, spanning tree would typically uh, disable softly a link. That way, a switching loop would not occur. Various implementation of STP. Again, depending which is the uh, root bridge, from there, transition to the appropriate root ports, designation ports, and the alternate port. The alternate port will be the port that's being softly disabled. Here we're dealing with uh, S1 being the root bridge. And again, all links heading back to the root bridge would be a root port. Everything going away from the switch will be a designation or designated port. And again, we can actually do, uh, we can force a re-election, so we can pick which will be the root bridge. Typically, it will be the lowest priority. If they're all the same, lowest MAC address. Here, S1 has the lowest priority with 24577 instead of the default 32769. So S1 becomes the root bridge. And then from there we have the appropriate path costs based off of bandwidth and link speed. That helps us calculate which ports to uh, change to an alternate port, thus disabling it. Again, the, we have the appropriate BDU frame formats the appropriate fields, which you guys can go through that. BPDU propagation. Again, as the switches come online, they will send things like root bridge, bridge ID, path cost, and they'll forward them to everyone. This allows an election to take place, and they can figure out who will become the root bridge, because again, when the, they are first turned on, all switches think they are the root bridge until they are converged. Here, S1 will do the same thing, S3 will do the same thing, and S1 will eventually become the root bridge because it has the lowest root ID or the lowest priority number. Extended system ID basically allows us to have more VLANs. They're in the bridge priority. Selecting the root bridge again. Normally we're going to be dealing with things facing users. They will be in port fast mode or BPDU guard. That way only the links between switches should be identified as a designated port or a root port. And then eventually an alternate port as that will be the one that is disabled. How do we mitigate STP attacks? Because you can spoof the root bridge, you can force ST or manipulation of STP. So again, we can actually have root guards and loop guards so that only the root bridge has the appropriate information it needs to control the other items, the other switches. Typically anything facing a access device, you're going to enable port fast and BPDU guard. That way a attacker cannot spoof or send STP BD, uh, BPDUs because from the access layer ports, those uh, devices will not have any STP DBDUs, so you don't have to worry about it. And there's an example. Configuring root guard. Basically, on the root bridge, you tell it that it's the root guard. 
and then you can actually set root ports to become root guards. You can also have what's called loop guards on ports preventing those loops. And this is chapter 6 in a nutshell. Again, this will make a little bit more sense when we get into our labs and we actually start seeing the layer 2 prevention technologies. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.